Hi, I'm Hannah Lason. I'm the head of youth and educator programs at the Portland Art Museum, and I am really excited to be here with two really amazing teachers from NEA Many Nations Academy. Um, ben and Ezra, would you all like to introduce yourselves? Yep, Ben, you wanna go? Uh, sure, I'm, I'm Ben Taylor. I'm the social studies teacher at the MNA. Um, and I've been there for six years and teach global studies, US history, government and econ. And I'm Ezra Whitman, uh, teaching language arts at Many Nations Academy. And I also taught PE during the pandemic, which was a lot of fun. And uh, I think I just completed my third year there. Um, yeah, that was a lot of fun too. <laughs> All right, could you all tell us, um, just give us like a brief description of uh, the projects that you created here uh, in connection with the Ansel Adams in Our Time exhibition at the Art Museum? Yeah, so I think, I think it was, initially it was Ben who kind of came to the group because we'd worked before um, and we're sort of developing a project learning project-based learning uh, sort of model at Many Nations and Ben came to us with this idea about doing work around the Ansel Adams exhibition, uh, which was really cool because I felt Ansel Adams' photography is definitely sort of a part of a, a prereq, I think, for people who are kind of getting into photography and wanting to explore art um, and understanding the, the, the tradition in art and even language. So I thought it was a really fun opportunity to engage students with, with imagery. Um, and so, yeah, so for my classes, I, this basically replaced what I had originally planned for the whole fourth quarter of global studies and U.S. history. Um, and yeah, we've just had good collaborations with the art museum in the past. And I think this particular exhibit worked really well um, to have students uh, do research and ask questions and think critically about um, history and geography. Um, and it just worked really well with my classes. That's great. Um, could you all say a little more about your goals for student learning uh, with these projects? And, and also maybe we're sharing, you generously shared your lessons and examples of the student work, um, but it might be helpful also to say more specifically kind of what you asked them to do. I mean, I think the goal, uh, at least for me personally, was during this year of remote learning, I wanted to try anything possible that was different to get students engaged. And so I think, um, you know, I, I think if I had done, if this, we had been in a normal, normal school year, we would have maybe made like, we would have visited the museum once and we would have done a couple little assignments with this. But um, I think having part of the, the thought process behind like making it the whole quarter long project was just like, let's mix it up and try something new and get students engaged um, because that was, a, a struggle for everyone uh, this last year. Um, and I always, you know, I've always found that incorporating artwork both as a, in history classes as like a source to learn history from and also as a outlet for student uh, expression it has always been successful in helping students get engaged. So um, that's, uh, just something I'm always trying to do, as well as giving students choice to choose, you know, to choose what they want to focus on and how they want to research their topics. So this project worked well with that as well. Yeah, I'd agree. I, it was definitely the main goal was just engagement. I think during the pandemic, that a lot of students were just kind of dislodged from the, from the whole learning, you know, the way schools dislodged from school in general. I think, and uh, that happened. I think through across many schools. So my main goal is like, all right, let's look at some really cool stuff. Let's let's make this uh, engaging and as hands-on as possible. I know we're not in a classroom, but we can still, you know, we'll send you materials. Well, it, and I should actually backtrack. I forgot to mention that 
our other component to the team was Renee, uh, who does cultural arts. Uh, and uh, they gave me permission to uh, speak on their behalf um, and wanted to also mention that the cultural arts aspect was mainly like studio art where uh, techniques and, and how to apply things like paint to a canvas in, in, in measured ways. They're learning those techniques, I guess, um, on top of uh, some more sort of traditional uh, crafts that Renee is really, really uh, versed in uh, that students could bring home with them. Things were sent home to students and they could engage uh, online that way through lessons in art. Um, and uh, what I found really fascinating about this whole project was there were native artists we could study through cultural arts, but then there were also histories that we could study through that were represented in the photographs. And there was also just the literacy around art that in language arts that they could learn by studying those photographs and interacting with the photographs that were in the exhibition. Uh, and that made it a lot of fun, especially when students when things start to open back up, I feel like students will be like, oh, hey, there is, I mean, the museum, <laughs> the museum is downtown. Like we can access these things and these, these events that are happening and we're, we're knowledgeable about things that are happening in the city. Because there are a lot of students that kind of exist on the outside, the outer rims of the city. You know, we don't access these, these things that happen, these programs. And I feel like learning how to, to stake a claim and, and understand things that are happening and the history of things that are happening was, was really important as things started to open back up. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. And I think also uh, just wanna emphasize, I mean, it seemed to me that the collaboration between the two of you and Renee, so the students were getting to um, do this research around ancestral lands uh, from all of these different disciplinary directions um, and get to produce their own work just really seemed really powerful. Um, and yeah, I hope building those connections with the museum also um, is powerful for them. Do you, Ben, did you want to add anything on, on what you felt was especially successful or Ezra, did you want to add to that? You, you started to, to answer that. Well, I, yeah, I think for language arts, um, one thing that was really successful was, uh, and I think this was, this was more from necessities coming from the pandemic and remote learning is making steps that are really concise and doable for students. Um, and also um, watching students use new vocabulary around discussing art and, and, and then applying that new vocabulary in ways that made them think a little more critically and how they could make these efforts in discussing deeper their own ideas. You know, a lot of times as our students will have these ideas, but not the words to, to express those ideas. And I think in large, our students are pretty just inherently artistic. They, a lot of them, we have a lot of artistic students, either in the way they speak, the rhythms that they use when they speak, or just, just the way they, just through drawing. You know, a lot of them are really into tattoo work and a lot of them are really into uh, fashion. And uh, I really wanted to, to keep those, those talents alive because that's a language, that was a language that I really wanted to develop. And it was really fun to see that happen, especially given our limitations that it couldn't happen in person. And I think in person, of course, there, there would be some things that'd be different. I think the work would be a little more rigorous only because we would see each other more often and we could actually say, we could answer those questions immediately, you know? Um, that couldn't be answered in just the way online forms <laughs> work. Um, and I think that would be even deeper, deeper diving into some of these, these topics. Um, I think <laughs> on, on, uh, along similar lines in my, at least in my classes, the way I'm always trying to, particularly this last year, make sure everything's like very structured and clear and accessible uh to all students in a in a way that like uh is oh it's just always accessible and they can do it on their own um and they know exactly what they need to do but at the same time it's important to when you're providing all that structure also provide 
opportunities for to kind of pull away some of the structure and not give students opportunities to be creative and do their own thing and take it in their own directions. And I think um, that this project was a really good example of um, that working well because leading up to the final step of making their own artwork, there was a lot of structure. Um, but then when you look at the variety of what students produced in the end and the way that they were able to express what they learned over the, the past couple months, um, it was pretty amazing how, how they were able to take it in whatever direction they wanted and they all did very different things. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, I don't know. It's important to have the structure, but it's also important to have the sense of ownership and the like freedom to do um, to do it the way they want to do it. Is there anything that you would do differently? Uh, I know, I mean, so you're already speaking to the specific conditions uh, of, you know, distance and hybrid learning. Um, are, are there other things that you would change if you uh, taught these projects in the future? I would, yeah, I for sure we just because uh, of the care that was needed and, and the time needed, uh, we weren't able to add uh, a unit on land acknowledgement, which is something I would absolutely change because I feel like we were gearing in that direction the whole time as far as recognizing, landscapes, recognizing histories of, of, of landscapes and what they look like now and our, our opinions about those landscapes. And all of that is buried so much, that is like built on the foundation of, of acknowledging land. And so I really wanted to, being you know, a native school or focusing on native students in the city, I really wanted to have that, um, that experience of drafting and crafting a Latin acknowledgement and understanding what that means for you personally. And then of course, how good it is to hear that for community members who are listening or reading your own ways of acknowledging. Uh, so in the future, that's something I would definitely want to prioritize in a way um, in in-person classrooms. I think that'd be a lot more, a lot more doable for sure. Um, I would definitely agree with that. We did include some uh, in our lesson or instructions, there's some land acknowledgement stuff that we included um, in what's shared, but we didn't have time to actually do it uh, the, you know, fully in our own classes this year. Um, but yeah, I would definitely do that uh, if I was gonna do this again. And I, I think that the other, it's not really something I would do differently, but I think that this project could be applied to any photograph. Like it doesn't have to be specific to this exhibit. So I think that mm -hmm. um, I, I think I could do this project again with different photos, even from like from a different part of the world or from a different time period. I think that the like the structure of the lessons mm -hmm. and instructions could work with um, photos or other types of artwork from an, any other art artist or era or, or place, potentially. I agree, yeah, absolutely. In fact, that kind of is sort of inspired me to play around with some, some uh, bigger project-based lesson plans that, that speak to especially tribal histories in, in more contemporary context and then working backward from there, um, especially when it comes to aligning curriculum with uh, legislation like SB 13. Um, in fact, as an example, just a quick example, uh, there are a lot of tribal leaders in this area who got together, formed a committee that's here in the city to talk about how their treaty rights were affected by dams placed all along the rivers. Um, and then all the changes that were made that the government wasn't acknowledging. These tribal leaders, and one of them is actually the ED at NEA right now, and so, <laughs> some of the kids' grandparents are, are some of these leaders, actually sued the federal government. Like, who does that? You don't, as small tribal ent entities, you don't sue big, giant governments. But they did. It took over a decade for that whole process, and they actually won that lawsuit as far as getting more power over their lands. And this is a huge history lesson that can be 
developed. You know, it's, it's also an opportunity to interview those leaders who are still around. This is a very very issue that dates back years and years and years. And when you look at the, the changing of the rivers, the Columbia River, the Willamette, how they change, what they used to look like, the photographs that exist around those. I mean, that's just one project that could mimic sort of this collaboration. So it's super exciting to think about. Wow, that is really exciting. I'd, I'd love to hear the ways that you all are imagining, elaborating and, and building on and adapting this. Um, it's just really inspiring. So could each of you just describe the lessons that you created uh, for this project? Um, sure, for the social studies components, uh, which was global studies in US history, uh, once students had chosen their Ansel Adams photo that they were going to work with, uh, they did some research uh, on the geography of the location. So they did some mapping research um, of the location where the photo was taken, including the tribal history um, and sort of the current status of the, the land. Um, and then they made their own maps to show what they had learned about the location. Um, and then we read an article by David Troyer in the Atlantic about um, where he's proposing that the national parks be returned to the tribes. Um, and so students uh, read that article and then, and then wrote their own reaction to, to this proposal. Um, not all of the photos were taken on national park land, but um, some of them, several of them were. Um, and the conversation over um, land ownership and federal land um, is applicable to all of the photos. Um, and then the final step before the students actually created their own artwork was to annotate their photos. So we looked at um, some of Wendy Redstar's annotations works as examples, and then students picked uh, a couple details um, that they see in the Ansel Adams photo to annotate. So just provide research and provide some context for what we're actually seeing when we look at the, the image. And then the final step after that was um, more open-ended and they basically just had to do, uh, do something with with the Ansel Adams photo to make it, add to it, mess with it, do something to it to kind of make it their own um, and say what they wanted to say about it. And then for language arts, uh, my lesson plans were, it was both for so two classes, nine and 10th grade, and then 11th and 12th grade, they all had similar um, steps to follow, uh, but they were had different terms based on their, their grade level. Uh, but the lessons that I have included are based mainly on 11, 12th grade. Um, and it was designed around four learning targets that we call them, um, and which are similar to just like units. And that first unit learning target one was basically just understanding a language learning plan. Like this is what we're going to be studying. These are the words to, to be on the lookout for. Um, and then try and review the words vocabulary that we studied last quarter. And you can apply those to your answers in the upcoming readings that we were going to do, the questions that I'd be asking. Uh, so the first target was just that one, understanding the learning plan and, and taking ownership and, and agreeing to expectations, like what's going to happen. And then the second target is where we started jumping into the um, sort of mood and imagery around what an American identity or even a landscape is. Uh, and we reviewed two key documents. One was a poem by Joy Harjo, uh, and we researched words around the mood and imagery and the history contained within those po in the poetry. Um, and students could interpret that poetry and read about uh, Joy Harjo's work and her bio, of course, uh, to come up with some ideas about the um, content in the poetry. And then we went into a um, the prologue to There There by Tommy Orange. Uh, in conjunction with an article that came out in the Portland Monthly about uh, one of the leaders, the leader, executive director of, of NEA, uh, who was pursuing uh, the change in the team logo of the Winterhawks, um, which tied in really well with what Tommy Orange is talking about in just the pro uh, prologue. Um, 
and that's some it, it's some really heavy reading if you go really into the book so i wanted to concentrate just on that beginning part because the message is so clear and then combine that with the latest in the news that was happening with the team change logo team, team change in portland students then provided their um their feedback and their opinions on that logo they're also uh, given the option to just write out a paragraph, a couple of paragraphs on their opinion, or if they wanted to, they could express their understanding through redesigning the logo itself. And some students uh, took some time doing that. Um, and then we moved on to Learning Target 3, which is where we started to concentrate on the Ansel Adams photographs, because by now, by, by now through Ben's class, they were researching the history of those photographs and really interacting a lot with those photographs. So as they were getting more and more um, I think uh, prepared with how to express their opinions, how to use certain words, how to describe certain moods. They would then look at these photographs with that uh, vocabulary. Uh, and then as they were looking at these photographs in the language arts classroom, they were also studying the history of things like the Pledge of Allegiance, because we were still working on American identity. And uh, also moved into that great article that uh, Ben provided about national parks being controlled by indigenous tribes as additional reading, because it's a long article. So it was nice to sort of piecemeal that between different classes um, and then gauge reading comprehension and students' questions about the content of the article. And then they had an option. Um, using that Ansel Adams photograph, they could then make an opinion. Uh, I decided to give them parameters. I'm like, you can talk about indigenous lands if control should be given back to indigenous lands, or you can talk about your opinion on the Pledge of Allegiance after doing some research on the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, to some students, if, if you give them, if their options are too wide, <laughs> they're kind of like, oh, I don't know what to do. But if they have a couple different options and then they can narrow it down, that's a little bit easier. Of course, they had free reign if they wanted to do something else. Uh, but it sort of culminated at the same time as Ben's class, as far as looking at those Ansel Adams photographs, understanding what they were, and then how to form an opinion by, by manipulating the photograph somehow or adding something to the photograph that, that kind of showed your opinion about what you thought of what that uh, photograph was speaking to or of. Um, but for the language arts component, they also had to then draft an artist's statement. So if the opinion wasn't clear and the opinion is actually pretty clear and almost all of the student work just by themselves, but then they had to describe their opinion in the artist's statement. Uh, and that was that third learning target. And then the fourth target was moving towards land acknowledgement and making it a, a personal and, and researched um, acknowledgement and presentation to give to any kind of an audience. Uh, we didn't make it to that point because of time um, and just our, our, our restrictions around remote learning, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, I think, after. <laughs> That's all great. Thank you. And uh, is there any anything else you all want to add? Um. They, yes, there's a couple of things from from Renee, actually, uh, a little bit more. And I'll put together the lessons that uh, Renee did for that class in cultural arts. Uh, but some things just to bullet point really fast is the cultural arts section, of course, was doing techniques on applying art, almost like studio art. But they also did stuff like they researched indigenous artists through interviews on things like YouTube. Um, students researched other art formats from chosen indigenous artists. So they had particular indigenous artists, both in like sort of in the neo-native movement and then more traditional arts. Um, and then they looked, of course, at Ansel Adams because that was sort of the, the requirement. But they also looked at Wendy Red Star and they looked at Zig Jackson. Some of uh, the interviews included in the zine that was there. And then um, practiced on things like poster boards, use magazine cutouts uh some different stickers and then they just incorporated their designs onto the Ansel Adams program as a way to interact and show opinions through art really fun yeah really fun and really cool and um yeah I I hope everyone looks at both the lessons that you all shared and the student work um and I just want to say a huge thank you to both of you and Renee um and to the NAIA students who participated in this project. We're really grateful for this partnership and uh, you all are just super inspiring. So thank you. Thank you.